In 1884, Sarah was back in Carson City and she played a part in calming an incident involving the Indians and the Chinese. Can you tell me something about the Chinese community here? As you can see today, it's all gone. Uh, we're surrounded by uh, traffic noise. It's very, very busy. Uh, in 1884, this was the largest Chinatown uh, in Nevada in terms of per capita population. Uh, almost one out of every four people were Chinese here. And if you look at our marker, you can see how big uh, that historic district was. Uh, many of the white population came to Carson City to buy herbs and la do laundry, get people to do service activities for them. We know that Sarah was involved in an incident here concerning the Chinese. Well, my understanding was uh, there was a murder of a Paiute. And the initial reaction in that, in that haze of what happened here, the Paiutes believed that the Chinese were responsible. Uh, there had been tension a long time with the Chinese uh, as far as the Pyramid Lake Paiutes uh, that had to do with Winnemucca Lake and the fishing rights. And so the first reaction on the part of the Paiutes were the Chinese did it. And it looked like there was going to be a wholesale retribution and Sarah Winnemucca was, was, a, was a peacemaker. She came here to try to make peace and do kind of an investigative work. She found out that it wasn't Chinese at all. Yes. A Washoe. But once it was determined it was a Washoe, justice was pursued, and the Washoe was convicted of a crime as opposed to being assassinated and sent to Alcatraz, as I understand. Throughout her years of involvement in the public arena, Sarah clung to her dream of educating her people. Her views are expressed in a letter she wrote to Paiute parents. A few years ago, you owned this great country. Today, the white man owns it all, and you own nothing. Do you know what did it? Education, education has done it all. Now what it has done for one man, it will do for another. It was in Lovelock, east of Carson City, that she was finally able to establish her Indian school on land that is now alfalfa fields, with support from the Peabody sisters in Boston. In 1885, Sarah had come full circle. This land was a part of the Humboldt Sink, where she was born but it had already greatly changed in 1885. Ranchers had been draining the lakes to create fields where they could grow alfalfa and grain, and by night, sheets of flame lit the tule marshes where the Paiutes had once plied their small boats. Sarah had long had it in her mind to start a school, and the natural pla place was the ranch belonging to her brother Natchez. I have the deed here in my hand in which it's stated that this land belonged to Natchez Overton, an Indian. Natchez had taken the surname Overton. Rumor has it that when Sarah later uh, was able, with the aid of Eastern supporters, to build a small frame school building, that a part of it was later incorporated into the building that surrounds me here now. Sarah began her school in a brush shelter. The boys would jump up when she said up to show they understood, and when she said down, they'd lie down on the ground to show they understood that too. Sarah would translate each word that she spoke in Paiute into English, and the children became so excited about the new words they were learning that they wrote them all over the fences of Lovelock. In 1889, Sarah was forced to discontinue her school for lack of financial support. She moved to Henry's Lake, Idaho, to live with her sister, Elma, and there she died under mysterious circumstances in October 1891 at the age of 47. She died believing that she hadn't accomplished nearly as much as, as she had wanted to. Those who have maligned me have not known me. It is true that my people sometimes distress me, but that is because words have been put into my mouth which have turned out to be nothing but idle wind. Promises have been made to me in high places that have not been kept, and I've had to suffer for this in the loss of my people's confidence. She was caught, I guess I would say, in the middle there. You know, the army used her. You know, she was lied to. The Indian people in her time didn't speak English, didn't understand English. They didn't know, they didn't see the big picture that was going on as we do today. Long after her death, Sarah remained a controversial figure. 
But as her statue took form in 2004, her long-held commitment to peace took on renewed life and the possibility of impacting those living today. And so we follow her footprints to the capitals. The last few weeks we've been all over the northern part of Nevada and in all those places there's been really no tangible remain and yet here now at the Nevada State Capitol in Carson City we have this incredible physical representation of Sarah Winnemucca. What in your view is the important thing about having this wonderful statue here at the Capitol? Sarah's here is an inspiration for all of us. Her brave life uh, showed us how you can take on anything, no matter what the odds. How could Sarah think that one lone woman with her voice could change the direction of American Indian policy? And yet Sarah tried it. Her watchword was always, it can be done. Her efforts to bring peoples together in peace instead of controversy was um, so much further uh, ahead of her time. And I hope she can see where we've come today. Her work is still alive. It's still evolving. And she just was, she, she lit a fire that is probably never going to go out.